Hello guys, Aquaba to the youth and moderated broadcast brought to you by FAO here at the KICC building. I'm Andrew Ndongu, operations manager Ziada Solutions. And my friend here is Abraham from Ghana, a farm manager at Vermont, Vermont Farm Services. I'm, a, I'm an exporter and a climate change enthusiast. It's great to be here with Abraham. It's always a pleasure to be here. Finally, I have a friend from Ghana. Yes, yes, I have a friend too. Okay, so the topic we'll be tackling today is how did we get started? How did we get into these industries that we're in? Such an interesting one. Okay, so I think we'll start with you. Tell me your story. Hmm. Well, so I started off um, studying agriculture. Mm -hmm. And um, at my undergrad level, okay. I did agriculture and um, I majored in post harvest. So I, I zoomed straight into export. I was looking at um, working directly with farmers, getting produce from farmers, and then also connecting to buyers outside. Mm -hmm. Then, fast forward, I realized that we're having challenges with quality. Mm -hmm. And so then there was a need for me to be on the grounds directly to see what the farmers are doing. So if you are looking at what the farmers are doing, then you should be practicing as well. So this is the story that brought Van Mar, uh, Van Mar Farm Services into being. So tell me more about Van Mar Farm Services. So Van Mar Farm Services, the, the, the key thing that brought Van Mar Farm Services to being um, is, is an, an issue of we supplying maize to a buyer, a local buyer in Ghana. And we, we thought that once you see the maize and it looks so white, it means that it is, it is clean. But there is more to that. When you are exporting or when you are supplying, there are quality checks you need to make. And so then one of the challenges we, we realized after running low analysis is that we had issues of aflatoxins. And so we had two trucks rejected. And as a supplier, if you buy your produce from farmers and then it is rejected, then what are you going to do? You have to sell to feed producers at cheaper prices. So if this is the issue, what leads to the production of the aflatoxins in there? It starts from the farm. Yeah. The, 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 the whole issue starts from the farm. And so you need to go back to the farm and see what is going on there. So Vermont Farm Services decided that we were going into farming ourselves to produce the maize and also see how best we can check some of these things. Speaking of aflatoxin, that's very interesting because it's a common case even here in Kenya. Oh, you, okay. you, you'll find that most of the farmers, they produce a lot of maize, mm. but they produce for local consumption. Okay. And due to poor storage and bad storage practices, yes. they end up consuming intoxicated maize. Yes. It's, it's the case in Ghana as well. You know, there was a documentary some time back on uh, one, one staple in Ghana called Kinky. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you may like to call it a corn ball. Corn ball. Corn ball. So it's, it's a dough. It's a corn dough. Mm -hmm. And um, it is molded into balls and cooked. So we, we take them with chili pepper, mm -hmm. the grounded pepper. Mm -hmm. There was a documentary that most of that staple on the market had traces of aflatoxins in them. And when the research was extended, we realized that people were developing all sorts of illnesses. And it was traced to that incident. And so it became an issue. It became something that we needed to pay attention to. And so for Van Ma, in our own small way, we decided that let's start from our own farm. Mm -hmm. Let's start something small. Let's see how best we can grow it. And then other things started coming in. All right. So we decided to go into vegetable production and then also mushroom production. And for the mushroom production, it would interest you to know that the, the training came from FAO. Okay. I, we, we, I, I was the, 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 the focal person to represent Van Ma. That we had that training on mushroom production, and so it, it has also become a part of what we do as 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 a company. Mm. You've mentioned something that really intrigued me. Mm. You said that you decided to start small. Yeah, that's a similar case to what you started because at Ziada, what was the case is that personally my background is in petroleum geology. Okay, and uh, I was working in a corporate office, very nice, but uh, I was not really comfortable with that environment mm. sitting in one place the whole day. I needed something that would help me move about. Yeah. So as soon as my contract ended, I did not renew it. I went into exploration on the field and all that. Mm. In the field, I ran into some biogas experts. Okay. And uh, it really sparked my interest, wow. especially now that I, I was switching from 
petroleum to biogas. Yeah, to biogas. It's funny when I tell you that there's a lot of correlation. Yes, there because, is. Because biogas is basically methane. Sure. So there's a lot of correlation between mm. those two. And uh, from there we started with biogas production. I was like a biogas technician. Okay. I used to install biogas to many workers mm. and many people. And uh, one of the partners at our company realized that um, after attending a forum in Naivasha, yeah. we realized that uh, you can do more with biogas. We saw, uh, it's called, I think it's a Syrian flower farm. Mm. And uh, what they do, they try to use all the waste, the all waste. the flower waste. Yeah. Yeah. They try to run a biogas system mm -hmm. with all that waste. Yeah. And then they try to feed the farmers with it. Yeah. So based on that idea, Ziada was born, whereby we realized that we have a, an idle piece of land somewhere mm. that is full of bananas. Yeah. In fact, these bananas are not even profitable. They're just idling around. We sell them just to be able to pay the workers, you know, and all that. And and you, I, you guys didn't think of exporting those bananas? Okay, you know, the farm is in a remote area. Okay. It's in Taveta, Kenya, like 400 kilometers from Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So be, because of the remoteness, even management is difficult, you know. And so in trying to figure out how can we manage the farm, and make it profitable yeah. and also add value not only to us but to the farmers and also other banana farmers because you've said a challenge in ghana yeah. you've said a challenge in kenya yeah. we, ha we are facing similar challenges True. because you're all africans True, yeah. so in the same case the challenges we are facing that back at aveta are the same challenges other farmers are facing mm. and uh, in trying to come up with a solution we try to combine biogas and the bananas okay. we realize that oh if the biogas can run the bananas the bio the pulp from the stem mm. can can run a biogas system yeah. it will be interesting now to create something circular something that integrates itself straight from the production of the banana yeah. to the stem that is left by the farmer mm -hmm. adding value so based on that we designed a local machine a decorticator okay. most of the people import but uh, we downloaded plans online watched a few videos in kenya we said to cut after jamwa kuchomelea welding guy mm. and welded the machine for us we bought a motor and voila, Ziada was born, started producing banana fiber. You guys didn't start small like I did. Uh, that's small, that's small. <laughs> no, that's not small, that's huge. <laughs> okay, it's, it's no, but, huge. Design. But with, 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 as a climate person, mm -hmm. I, I like the fact that there is this, there, you guys are doing the biogas thing because mm -hmm. traditional African setting, we, we like to do a lot of burning, mm -hmm. cutting of trees to burn, use them as firewood and Including all that. Including during land clearing. You know, and, and, and this is also contributing to our, uh, what do you call it, our carbon emissions. You yeah. know, the trees serve as carbon sinks for us. True. And so if we are cutting them, it's mm -hmm. not helping. So with the biogas coming in, mm -hmm. one, we are reducing the waste out there, mm -hmm. and then two, we are making something uh, something better out of it. Exactly. And then also solving another problem. So it's mm -hmm. like, you're solving a number of problems at the same time. And another problem you know, we're solving, you know, most of the fibers people use are, are, are synthetic fibers. Yeah. So what we do, we produce banana fibers from the banana stem. Mm. And the fibers are very good, especially for making things like paper, yeah. clothes, yeah. and all that, because they decay at the end of the day. Yes. They don't harm the planet. Yes, they are, they are biodegradable. Mm -hmm. And mm. you also mentioned something to do with carbon. Carbon, yeah. And in relation to carbon, we're also doing biochar, which is something we've started yes, recently. Yes, yes. It's, it's, it's something that um, uh, Climate Smart Agriculture looks at. Mm -hmm. So if you are you are into biochar production, then I think that there is a very bright future for agriculture in Africa. Yeah, yeah. Because incorporating that in your farm, okay, helps a lot. All right, it helps the crops a lot. It it, it allows the soil to feel very loose, uh -huh. and then it makes it makes it, it gives the stem that the roots of the plants very firm firm grounding and all that. So I think that, and then also water retention and all that. So yeah. I think it's it's a good thing that you guys are looking at. And something else people don't know about biochar. Mm. It can be used as to carbon sinks. Carbon, yes, yes. Biochar absorbs carbon. Yeah. And not only does it help the soil in areas like with soil salinity yeah. and all that, it yeah. also acts as a carbon sink, yeah. which says so much about what we are doing to save the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So tell me something about the challenges you experience with the farmers and hmm. trying to convince them because I know growing products for export. Yes. Big challenge. You know, I think that we, we, those who are, excuse me to say, who are, who are fortunate enough to have had higher learning in agriculture, I think that we lost sight of one important thing, that is indig indigenous knowledge. You know, we, we, we tend to look down on some of these farmers and it angers them a lot. Yeah. Okay. 
So one of the challenges we faced and we found a way around it has to do with always trying to listen to the farmer more, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you finding a way to bring your technical know-how in there rather than going directly to impose everything on the farmer. Mm -hmm. When you go imposing it, they will get angry and you will not get what you want. Mm -hmm. So it's quite difficult. And then another issue has to do with the language, the language barrier. You know, yeah. Ghana Ghana has so many languages, mm -hmm. so many. If if I'm not if I'm not exaggerating, we should have more than 100 local languages in Ghana. Oh. And so if you are visiting very rural areas where lots of production goes on, especially our food baskets like the middle belt and then the northern belt of ghana mm -hmm. they do lots of production mm -hmm. most of our staples are produced from there so mm -hmm. these are people who speak very local languages and they don't understand the english you and i will speak mm -hmm. and so when you go there and then you don't understand the language and you're unable to communicate what exactly you want then it becomes a problem mm -hmm. you, you understand i understand yes, what so, you what you've mentioned is also a challenge in Kenya mm. because there's this emerging trend in farming mm. whereby to be a digital farmer you need data, mm. you need all the data. Yeah. And now when you're going around to the farmers trying to collect all that data, yeah. it's a challenge because not only because of the language barrier, yeah. but yeah. I don't know about your take on this, but they feel like you're infringing in their privacy, trying to learn how many acres do you have, what have you farmed, yeah. what is the possible... Yeah. It's good for the data and it's important for us yes. as the agripreneurs. Yes. But for the farmer, it feels like... You're worrying them. Yeah. So, you see, things like that, you find a way around it. And one thing that moves them a lot mm -hmm. is when you are able to remunerate them. Mm -hmm. So when we go to engage them, mm -hmm. first and foremost, we let them understand that what we are doing is to help them. Mm -hmm. So if I'm asking you about the, what do you call it, the, your land size, if I'm asking you about the quality of your soil and all that. It is to help policymakers decide on what exactly they can do to support what you are doing. So first, we let you understand this. And then when, when we are done with the data we've collected, we find some remunerations for them. Sometimes it would interest you to know that even one loaf of bread and they're excited, you know. Because where they find themselves, it is difficult to come to town to even get a loaf of bread. You uh -huh. give them a bar of soup and they are very happy. Because it's not easy. They're not ac easy to access even you the know, shopping centers. Yes, so you, it, it's a matter of you finding a way around some of these things. See how, but you should you should think like the way they do, and then see how you can break into that space. Exactly. Yeah. And speaking about remunerating the farmers, it's mm. a very very interesting way yeah. of getting the youth involved in agriculture. Mm. Because if you are to ask me from my point of view, to get youth involved in agriculture. You need to make agriculture profitable. Very much. If there's money, that's why forex traders are doing all this. Yeah. You know, the yeah. cloud and all. It, 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 they make forex look profitable. Yes. Mm -hmm. In the same way, we need to make agriculture look profitable. Yeah. And at Ziada, we do that by, we purchase the stems mm. from the farmers. Wow. The only challenge we have in terms of purchase is that because of the records, we try to pay them digitally yeah. using M-Pesa. Mm. And uh, it's a challenge because... We are close to the Kenya-Tanzanian border. Most yeah. people are half Kenyan, half Tanzanian. Mm. And uh, they don't even have a Kenyan line. You know? Wow. So, some people don't even want digital payments. They say, I'll be cut with withdrawal charges. Whoa. It's a little less, so pay me cash. Mm. That's another challenge we face. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, farmers, farmers will always give you problems. Yeah, yeah. Farmers will always give you problems. Mm -hmm. and, and like I said, they are not as fortunate as you and I mm -hmm. are. And so the way they understand things mm -hmm. is different from how we understand things. And so we must always find a way around it. Yeah. You know, your, your biogas thing, mm -hmm. I, something came to mind. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we, we like to also do mm -hmm. is to export briquette charcoal. Charcoal briquettes. Yes. And most of the time, people have focused more on... People have focused more on the use of, of sawdust than the rest. But I think that we can use more, we can do more from, we can do, use more raw materials to produce briquettes. For instance, most of these fruit juice processing companies, since you guys are into this banana thing, that's why I'm bringing that up. Uh -huh. These fruit juice companies, when they extract the juice from the, the fruits, mm -hmm. the pulp, what happens to them? All the waste, all the pulp, it, they throw it, it away. It becomes waste. I, I was reading something online recently and I realized that there are, there are people I don't know, I, I, I don't recall where exactly, but I realized that there are people who dry the pulp, mm -hmm. they, 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 they spread it on a bare land, leave it for a long time until the moisture is completely dry, mm -hmm. then they compress 
The chaff. Then they use that to produce briquette. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. I never thought and of I, that. And I think that this goes a long way in reducing the waste we produce, yeah. especially on our farms, post-harvest losses. And a fun fact about what you've said, by letting by letting those the, the pulp mm. decay yeah. in the land, mm. it produces methane. Methane, yes. And methane is five times as potent as CO2. Yes. Oh, that's something people don't know. Yes. So mm. then it means that we should we should go into something we call carbon capture. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah, carbon we, capture. Yes, like carbon we capture. We find a way of a, a way we can we can we can prevent the methane from escaping into the atmosphere because once it's there, then we are in trouble. We can deal so with it. I don't know how they are going about it, but I think I have to read more to see how it is done. And since you guys are also into the banana thing, I think that it's something you should also look at mm -hmm. and see how best it should be it should be handled. Okay, we will yeah. look into that. Yeah, you should. And you something should. something you mentioned uh, back to the biogas thing. Mm. Another challenge I have with farmers: uh, the biogas gives us bioslurry, which is very very good organic fertilizer. Mm -hmm. But convincing the farmer to use the bioslurry instead of organic uh, inorganic fertilizer, mm. big challenge. But what is what is the narrative here in Kenya when it comes to Organic farming. What is the narrative? Organic farming. For the people who do it professionally, yeah. they do it for export. Mm. And they are organic certified. Yeah. To become organic certified is a clear challenge. Very very big challenge. Mm. But people are slowly taking up organic farming in Kenya. It's slowly growing popularity. Mainly because organic foods fetch a better price. Yeah. And you know, everything is market driven. But I think it shouldn't, it shouldn't solely be for export. Yeah. If we are exporting organic foods out, out there, what about how about we those in the country? Are, are we not good enough to eat organic foods? Yeah. It should be a lifestyle. Yeah. I think that we should look at reducing our inorganic fertilizer use, and that that is part of one of the the trainings we give our farmers mm -hmm. when we go to the field to collect data. Mm -hmm. We find a way to let them understand that it is important that we make use of uh, uh, organic fertilizers, or we look for. Uh, um, what do you call it, climate smart ways of doing things such that we don't we stay away from most of these inorganics. And so with that issue, if you are introducing something like that to the farmer, I don't think that it becomes so much of a problem. Yeah. Reason why I ask that what is the narrative here in Kenya when it comes to organic farming? Mm -hmm. you, you understand? I understand. Yes. There's something funny about organic farming in Kenya. You'll realize that all these crops that we grow organically yeah. are for export. We don't consume them locally. Mm. What we consume are the low-grade stuff. All the high-grade, everything that's quality is exported. So it, it is, it's an issue of making the farmers understand that it shouldn't always be about export, yeah. but we should also think about ourselves Our too. local markets. Yes, we should consume the chemicals yeah. so that those out there consume the very healthy ones. No, mm. it shouldn't be like that. It should be a lifestyle. Yeah. We should focus more on organic farming mm -hmm. so we stay healthy because the inorganics are becoming too much. Very much. Each and every day, there is a new sickness. There is this, there is that, and most of these things come from some of these chemicals. Exactly. You know, chemical residues in our produce and all that. So, mm -hmm. I, I I think that we have to focus more on that. Mm -hmm. And if there is a need, then there should be lots of education on organic farming. Mm -hmm. Bring in very key uh, experts who would, you know lead or lead the charge so that we see that these things are done properly. Yeah, and just to take you back on organics, back to biochar. Mm. If your farm maybe has been polluted by organic fertilizers, mm -hmm. with the use of biochar, you yes. can tend to neutralize these yes. factors. Yes, yes, And it will maybe open up your products for the international yes. market. Yes, yes. Which it's is something it's, we also need to look into. Yes, we really have to. We, I think that the, the biochar thing is, is very important. And it should really and gain traction in Africa. Very, very much. I think that it all plays into the entire climate, dis climate discussion, mm -hmm. climate smart agriculture. It should be something that we should champion so much. It should be something that we should put our energy and our efforts into. And currently, the COP28 is, is, is on way. I don't know whether they are done. Uh -huh. And I believe that most of the discussions there has to do with how to reduce our carbon emissions. Yeah. Okay. And so if we are looking at developing climate smart agricultural practices, then we are contributing to that reduction. And so it's important that we look at some of these things very much. And something that needs to happen in Africa, we need to start being educated on such things. We need carbon credit courses, you know. Yes. That's the type of knowledge we need. Very much. We all know how to plant a seed. Mm. We all know the importance of fertilizers. Yeah. We all know inorganic fertilizers are not the best. Yeah. But we still do because we have the knowledge. And those who have the option, they go for 
organic way. You know, but you, the knowledge is important. You know, one of the, the one of the challenges that we face as exporters, uh -huh. it has to do with chemical residue. It has to do with quality. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yeah. Now we are producing with lots of inorganic fertilizers. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you when you you export, mm -hmm. all right, and you don't have a buyer who is very kind enough, trust me, you will lose everything. You will not get even a dime for it. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. Because you are sending something that is that has so much chemicals in it, mm -hmm. and this is a problem. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So right. we, we have to start looking at how to change how we do things. Mm -hmm. Europe, uh -huh. Europe is is coming up with something new, and very soon I think it will be all all over the place. What they are trying to do is that very soon there will be certification on products that are sent to Europe, mm -hmm. and it's going to be based on production that does not lead to carbon emissions. Oh, that's very interesting. So I you see, then it becomes a problem for we in Africa, especially when we are focusing more on inorganic chemical use. Yeah. It becomes a very big problem. And so then we have to quickly change the narrative. And I think Africa, we are way behind when it comes to the climate discourse. Yeah. Trust me, we Despite are. Despite the fact that we are not the major polluters, we are very behind. We are way behind. And, and, I, and you see, when 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 they they see that it is becoming a problem they quickly come here to do investments yeah in in uh, offset programs mm -hmm. so what are we doing we are giving them the opportunity to just do whatever they want to do but that shouldn't be the case on our land on our land yeah we should start something on our own we should change the narrative mm -hmm. we should drive we should drive the narrative you you understand yes i had a very very funny instance at the farm mm. concerning the inorganic and organic fertilizer. Mm. There's a big organic farm close by. Yeah. And uh, like I told you, we produce by slurry and I was trying to, to market the product. Mm. So I visited the farm management and I told them, we have this product, very interesting, from bananas to bananas, you know, mm. Mm. Very, very nice. And the guy told me, the product is perfect. I can see the test results, they're looking good, but they only have one issue. Are your products organic certified? So I told them, no. He told me another issue I have. When you source your stems from the farmers, mm -hmm. some of these farmers use inorganic, inorganic fertilizers. fertilizers. Yes. And then the pulp from these stems, you come and use it to, to make produce. organic fertilizer. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It, doesn't it doesn't make, make sense. sense so, it, so the the whole issue on ensuring there is there is no trace of inorganic chemicals in mm -hmm. there has to start from the beginning. Yeah, from, production. from the farmer. Yes, exactly. From the farmer, mm -hmm. and. It means that you and I have lots of work to do. We really have to be on the farm. We really have to always engage them. We really have to let them understand the need for us mm -hmm. to stay away from these things. And to make such an impact, it takes time. It will take time, but trust me, we don't have time. Because we are going through a modern agrarian revolution. If we you we don't it. have lots of time. Even yeah. though it will take time, we don't have lots of time. And it must start now. True. We really have to start now. Yeah. If we want to say that we don't have time, my brother, we will be wasting all the time. <laughs> we, and nothing will be done. You mm -hmm. understand? So we, we have to start some somewhere. Mm -hmm. We have to start small. Mm -hmm. Gradually, those who equally are getting into the space will see the wisdom in it. They'll buy into the idea. Then we need to do lots of sensitization programs mm -hmm. so that people are made aware of some of these things. And then gradually we'll make progress. And something I learned when we were starting up the, the company, mm. I realized that start now and start with what you have. Mm. You know, mm. you don't need millions, you don't need... Start with what you have. Yeah. And you'll, you'll definitely do something. Yes. You know, yes. start with the cow dung from your farm as organic you fertilizer. Know, the poultry droppings. Exactly. You know, so I, I think that, I think that we, we, yes, the complaints are coming, mm -hmm. but I think we as young people, we should we should start moving away from the complaints and start thinking of what we can do how we can start it in our own small way we yeah. started gradually if you don't start something there is a saying in in in, in ghana mm -hmm. that if you don't carry it to your knee mm -hmm. how then do i help you carry it to your head so if you want investors to come and support you uh -huh. and you haven't started something mm -hmm. they don't see what you are doing mm -hmm. how then do they come in so in our own small way let's start something mm -hmm. then they would also come see the progress we have made and then give the needed support so we get to where we have to get to exactly they yeah. give us all the extra support provided you've started something yes you need a baseline yes the bank can't just give you a loan yes. because of your idea and you need, uh, you need an idea on the ground no matter how small yes yeah and and i think that we we, we really have to 
we really have to commend FAO for what they are doing Indeed. because you know FAO is giving young people the platform yeah gradually to start something on their own build something you know so that you can also small your own small way add to the production then whatever support there is whichever institutions that think that they have to come to support who come in with the support they, they, they can give you so yes we will commend FAO for what they are doing we are much grateful for their support the support they are giving young people and then the, the focus on ensuring that we have good food from farm to fork yeah, yeah. that definitely impacts they create a lot of impact yeah. and it's funny because we never contacted them mm. but they found a way to find us all the way to our farm yes because they do lots of research mm. they know the challenges that the people are facing they are on the ground they are on the ground yeah and so yes they know they know that this is the way to go and we the young people must come in to support yeah yes and so I'm, I'm really happy that this this connect is ongoing and I believe that we'll do lots of networking and in our own small way, we can s disseminate information amongst our peers yeah. and see where we can take this charge, see where we can get to. And I think we need like a forum or a way to connect youth in Africa, especially youth in agriculture in Africa. Yeah. You know, maybe some form of even social media, mm -hmm. whereby like LinkedIn for agriculture, mm -hmm. like African youth in agriculture. So you're bringing something up. Uh, it's an idea. Maybe we should not take a tech guy, yeah, but that's should, an idea. Maybe we should sit tech and, then, guys, and see. Maybe we can sit, mm -hmm. look at how we can go about it. Yeah. If we have to bring the tech guys and we bring them in and we see how we can play around it. Yeah. We should start it. It shouldn't just come as an idea mm -hmm. and then we leave it on the table mm -hmm. go back to doing the old stuff. No. Mm -hmm. Once the idea comes, yeah. we should we should move at, at it. Mm -hmm. If we don't have the expertise to get it done, let's, mm -hmm. let's find out those who are the experts who can guide us to get it done. Exactly. Good. If you use Youth Connect as an example, we are so many youth here. Yeah. So many youth. Mm. But like, we have even more watching us online. Yeah. And if we had such platforms, we would be able to interact with them directly. Yeah. They'll see you making your pitch. Mm -hmm. They'll see you in the panel, maybe. Mm -hmm. And they'll contact you the same way the people here on the ground are contacting you after they see you physically. Yeah. It would be something like that. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's the, Like I said earlier, the Connect is really a good platform. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't only limit it to the social media platforms and all yeah i mean as yeah. we we when we leave this place we will meet a lot of people mm -hmm. as we move about socializing and also trying to interact and get people to understand the message what we need to do how we go about it yeah. then it will move them to always want to look for the experts in the space to see how best they can also be a part of it exactly and yes. the skill that is slowly dying among our generation mm. is social networking yeah. Everybody has followers on Instagram, but on the ground we'll just sit. You know, you because can't network. You'll attend this event and you'll not talk to people. You know, social networking is a skill that also the youth need. Yes. Because that's the only way you can grow. It's yeah. not all about capital. Mm -hmm. Your network is your network. network. Is exactly. Exactly. It's very, very important. Networking is very important. And I'm very happy to meet you. Yeah. And I'm glad to see mm -hmm. what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. And I believe that would. We'll We'll share lots of ideas yeah as much as we we'll share with other colleagues out there we'll see how we can we can handle some of these issues in our own small corner yeah it's good to see fellow agripreneurs you it's, know it's always a pleasure when it's you're always located a pleasure. In, a, in a remote corner of ghana or a remote corner of kenya it, it doesn't matter we should always be able to get in touch and then you know have some of these conversations and not just leave them as conversations but then see them as actions put them into practice mm -hmm. and then see how best we can change the narrative mm -hmm. and i think with that we can give our parting shots yeah so i what i would say is that there is a lot of work to be done and most of our our young young people out there they shouldn't give up they shouldn't it's not going to be easy mm -hmm. but we have to put in a lot of effort to ensure that we want to change the narrative we want to see a better africa we want to improve on our cultural production and we want to be able to compete on the international market when it comes to export. We want to also stay sustainable mm -hmm. as far as climate change is concerned. And I believe that we will make lots of impacts. True, true. Yeah. Yeah. For the youth, I think what we really need, invest in networking, mm. invest in knowledge. Mm. The rest will come. It's yeah. not about the money. It's not about, it's not about the speed. Yeah. Good things take time. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yeah. In as much as you have all the money in the world, you can't build it such a building in a day no uh, unless you're the chinese but <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway but with that i've mm. been 
honored to be part of the podcast. It's it's always a pleasure to have great minds like yourself. Yeah. And it, it feels good to have such conversations because exactly. it makes me feel like this is what I want to do and this is where I want to be. It makes so, you realize you're in the right place. You know, so it's always a pleasure. It's yeah. always and a now, pleasure. Through this Youth Connect, we're mm. meeting the right people. Yes, yes, definitely. And we hope to beat more people so we can expand and then we improve. Okay, okay. Mm. Mm. So, well, uh, one, one phrase that I learned in, in Kenya, mm-hmm. is that, is what? Nemeka funga, huh? Yeah, umeka funga. Nemeka funga. Yeah. Asante sana. Karibu, karibu. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, a phrase that I learned in Ghana, mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. so. <laughs> it's a bit difficult. It's a, it's a bit difficult. difficult.